Would it surprise you to learn that an entire town in remote Alaska was abandoned because the inhabitants were being killed by Bigfoot-like creatures? If this catches your interest, go get yourself a hot cup of tea or coffee and sit back in a comfortable chair while we explore the shocking story of the Portlock Bigfoot massacres. The remote towns of Port Locke and Port Chatham are located on the southern end of the Kenai Peninsula. They were initially founded to provide shelter for ships in the area. The region was prone to regular storms, so it was needed. Port Locke was named after Captain Nathaniel Port Locke of the Royal Navy, who first landed there in 1787. The adjacent Port Chatham was named after HMS Chatham. Both towns are so close that the names are often used interchangeably. By the early 20th century, the town had grown into a flourishing community with a bountiful cannery facility, salmon being its main resource. By 1921, Port Lock had grown so large that the US government officially issued it with its own post office. The wilds of the Kenai Peninsula were so remote that the only way to access the region was by boat or seaplane. This meant that apart from the local Alouette tribe, the community had no contact with outsiders. Endowed with a bountiful supply of resources, Port Lock quickly blossomed, leading to a rapidly expanding community, which in turn attracted more settlers. Soon, chromium deposits were discovered, which prompted the development of a mining camp named Chrome, situated about 26 kilometers north of Port Lock. Prospectors also flocked to the region, salivating at the thoughts of untapped gold deposits that may be hidden in the unexplored mountains. The township was composed of a potent mixture of Eskimo and Russian descendants, hardly the type of people prone to timidity or hysteria. Life in the harsh environs of Alaska tended to harden people to a certain degree, leaving little time for fantasy or make-believe. Although stories started to spread from the very first years of the settlement, things would take a turn for the worst in the 1930s, and would continue to worsen right on through the years of World War II until eventually the entire population of Port Lock would abandon the town en masse and relocate to the surrounding villages of Port Graham and Namalek. So why did they leave? According to Namalek's oldest resident, Melania Helen Keel, in an interview with Naomi Clouda of the Homer Tribune back in October of 2009, the former residents of Port Lock and Port Chatham were driven out by what the local Alouette tribe called the Nantanak, which translates as Big Hairy Creatures, or Big Hairy Thing. The tribe warned the townsfolk that what faced them was no bear, but a group of cursed man-like beasts. Melania's testimony carries weight because she was actually born in Portlock, and left with her parents when they fled to Namalek. Throughout the following years, her parents insisted that they left due to the constant terror of the Nantanak. The beginning of the town's experience with the Nantanak was subtle at first, consisting mostly of strange noises at night. The hunters began to discover large footprints in the woods encompassing the town. One such group of hunters even claimed that they had come across a set while out tracking a moose one morning. The footprints, they said, were approximately 18 inches in length, and it seemed that whatever had left them behind was also tracking the moose. Out of curiosity, the hunters followed the tracks until they came across the site of a furious struggle. Hot congealed blood was strewn about the area and the foliage had been trampled and uprooted as though a great battle had just taken place. The large footprints encircled and then merged with the moose's tracks in what the hunters believed to be a kill spot before leaving the area and heading farther on up into the mountains. It also appeared to the hunters that the impressions of the footprints had gotten more pronounced sinking deeper into the soft soil. They believed that whatever had left the tracks had killed a full-grown moose and was now carrying its carcass up the mountains. 
Scared by the sheer physical strength needed to accomplish such a feat, the hunters decided not to follow any farther. Hikers and prospectors also reported finding fully grown trees that had been torn out of the ground, flipped upside down, then replanted head first into the earth. How this was done puzzled everybody. Not even a grizzly bear had the strength or capability to rip out a full grown tree from the earth, flip it, and then replant it upside down. Ten silverback gorillas couldn't accomplish such a feat. It would take a team of men and a lot of large equipment to manage something like that. And who would bother going to such lengths? What was the point and purpose? After these events became commonplace, the communities of Port Lock and the adjacent Port Chatham were on edge. Tensions were on the rise, and that's when the disappearances began. Hunters who ventured out into the woods to hunt all sheep would not return. Loggers and prospectors would go missing. Dozens of people would never be seen again. Eventually, when the rains came, body parts would be flushed down into the bay, limbs seemingly torn out of the sockets, as if a child would the wings of a fly. The damage inflicted to the body parts was not consistent with the tearing and ripping action of a grizzly bear, more like something with great strength had literally pulled them apart. Andrew Kamluck was a worker on the cannery at Port Lock before starting a logging company with several of his colleagues. In the beginning, things went well, but Andrew's colleagues eventually stopped showing up because of the strange things that happened while they were out in the woods. Axes would be snapped in half at the handle, seemingly as if no thicker than a matchstick, and their equipment would be scattered and damaged overnight, every night. The other men were afraid. They knew something was out there, and it meant them harm, so they stayed away, sudden believers in the stories about the Nantanok that they had always dismissed growing up. But Andrew was convinced that it was the work of another logging operation. He believed that they were simply trying to scare him off, so he continued his work in defiance. This meant he was out in the woods alone quite often. Sometime in 1931, he went out logging as he had done many times before but on this occasion he would not return. A search party was sent out to look for him, and they eventually found his body at the logging site, face down on the ground, lying at the base of a tall tree. The back of his head had been caved in, as if he had been struck from behind by a heavy object. Ten feet away from him, the searchers discovered the log skidder that Andrew used to strip down the logs after they had been chopped and sectioned. It was covered in blood. From the looks of the murder scene, the searchers concluded that something had used a skitter in the same manner that a man might use a club, and had struck Kamluk in the head with it. When it was done, it had cast the instrument aside as if it weighed nothing. No one man could have picked it up and wielded it in such a fashion. It took four men just to move the skitter back into position. Tensions increased when a sawmill owner, Tom Larson, who cut wood to repair old fishing traps for a living, headed out to replenish his stocks. While walking down the beach, he spotted a large hairy figure in front of him. It stared at him intently. Larson was certain it was no bear. It looked human, but much bigger. In a panic, he ran back to the house to fetch his rifle. When he returned, he found the creature was still standing there and still staring at him intently. Larson aimed his rifle, but couldn't fire. The beast turned away and it vanished into the woods. Larson could never figure out why he hadn't pulled the trigger. My guess is that the hominid's massive frame caused the fate that he had in his rifle to falter. Albert Petka was a reclusive man. He liked to moor his houseboat upriver, far out of town, away from other people. One night, he was awoken by a strange howling noise. It didn't sound like a wolf or any other animal that Petka had heard before. Curious and somewhat concerned, he rose from his bed put on some warm clothes and grabbed his shotgun. He went outside, torch in hand. Immediately, a tall, bulky figure emerged from the darkness. Petka said it was covered in hair, and if not for his sheer size, he would have taken it for a wild man. Upon seeing Petka, the beast moved toward him, howling and screaming in the same fashion that had attracted Petka's attention in the first place. Petka raised his weapon and tried to take aim, but before he could fire, the huge animal closed the distance with blinding speed, swatted his shotgun out of his hands, and lifted him into the air. 
Horrified, Petka was unable to resist the creature as it slammed him repeatedly into the hull of his houseboat. After several blows, the creature cast him aside as if he were nothing and continued on with its journey along the beach, disappearing into the darkness. Somehow, Petka managed to drag his broken and shattered body back onto the houseboat and set it adrift. As Pekka was unable to steer the boat, it ran aground sometime during the night. The next morning, a group of hunters came upon the grounded houseboat, sitting ominously on the banks of the Yukon River. They noted with some horror that the outside of the boat was smeared with large quantities of blood. Curious, the hunters boarded the boat and found Petka inside, barely alive and only able to whisper between laboured breaths. He told the hunters what had happened to him, warned them that there was something out there lurking in the woods. Then he died. When his body was brought back to town, the doctor there examined him and was struck by the man's injuries. He could not make a determination as to what kind of animal was able to inflict such severe internal damage. Not long afterward, a renowned and respected hunter went out into the woods to check his traps. Since there was heavy snowfall at the time, he decided to take his sled and dogs with him. It was late in the evening when he had finished his work. Rather than risk travelling back to town in the dark, he decided to make camp. After gathering some wood, he lit a campfire and settled in for the night. While boiling water for his coffee and cooking his supper, he heard a noise behind him. Before he could turn around, he was struck several times by crippling powerful blows. A large hairy creature was savagely attacking him and would surely have killed him on the spot if not for his dogs, which attacked the creature and made it flee into the darkness. Seriously injured, the man climbed back onto a sled and the dogs took him back to town. He received treatment for his wounds and managed to tell a story before succumbing to his injuries. It was concluded that the man had died from several ruptured organs caused by severe blunt force trauma. Around this time, a strange woman appeared. She had an unnaturally white face and a black dress that was so long it would drag behind her. She would be wailing as she emerged from the cliffs and when approached, the woman would vanish into the air like smoke. Those who were unfortunate enough to get a close view of the woman said her face was strangely deformed and when any attempts to communicate were made, she would vanish. A story started to circle around town, a group of cannery workers, emboldened by alcohol and numbers, went out into the mountains for a hunt. They didn't return. After a time and heavy rainfall, one of the men's bodies finally washed downstream into Port Chatham. He'd been horribly mutilated and dismembered. Over the next few weeks, more body parts washed down into the bay. Again, the damage inflicted was not consistent with what one would expect from a bear. Similar events continued to occur as time went on. Dozens of people disappeared or turned up mutilated. By 1949, it had become all too much for the people of Port Locke and Port Chatham. Overnight, both communities abandoned their homes and fled to the surrounding towns of Port Graham and Namalek, away from the constant attacks of the Nantanak. All but one, the postmaster. He had to remain behind to finish up the closure of the post office. For an entire year he stayed in the abandoned town, alone. He would have known about the killings, the mutilated bodies, the missing souls. He would have heard the howling at night, the crashing of large creatures moving through the woods and into the town. He would have no company other than the sound of his own breathing and the animals outside his door. And that was the end of the flourishing towns of Port Lock and Port Chatham. They would silently drift into the ages like a leaf on a flowing stream. But it was not the end of the story, for tales of the events continued on throughout the years. More information is constantly surfacing. The people who lived through the events regaled the next generations of the legend of the Nantanak and the horror that they had brought to their once blossoming town. And although the last remaining people from that era are now disappearing, due to the ravages of time rather than some rabid hominid, the stories will not die, they will go on. We live in a time when people believe that all things have been quantized and logged, ignorant to the fact that a sizable chunk of Canada and Alaska have never actually been explored. The mountain gorilla was considered a myth up until they were officially discovered in 1902. 
now they are accepted as a given. Alaska is still to this day an untamed wilderness, a massive landmass that is rich in vegetation, fauna and untouched by man. Anything could be out there. Is the possibility of the Nantanak being some undiscovered hominid really so hard to believe? If I had the money and the means, I would gear up a team of retired special operators, trackers, dock a bay ship out there in the bay and deploy those heavy hitters into the region. Drones, knives, sharp sticks, leave no stone unturned. But maybe I won't have to. The town of Namalek, which holds private ownership of Port Lock to this day, has recently been given strong consideration to re-establishing the town. Port Lock may live again. I would suggest keeping an eye on the situation as it unfolds, because of a strong feeling that the Nantanak hadn't quite done. Thank <laughs> you.